Howdy, and welcome to part 3 of my Bevy tutorial series. In the last two videos, we covered many of the basic topics in Bevy. Today we are going to continue using these concepts to add some of the basic gameplay features to our tower defense game. First, we're going to create enemies for our towers to shoot at. Then we will handle aiming the towers at the closest enemy. Finally, we'll write the basic collision detection and damage systems to allow towers to kill enemies. Also, we'll finally cover how to organize our projects and create our own plugins to group systems together. Now to make our tower defense game actually a game, the first thing we need is targets for our tower to shoot at. I'm going to create a new component called target, and I'll give it a speed value for now. Also, just to keep things clean and debuggable, I will derive reflect and use reflect component, which allows us to register the type on the app builder and edit the speed value in the world inspector. I'm also going to create a health component and give it an integer value. Now we can just spawn some temporary PBR mesh cubes, just like we did in the first episode. On these, we'll add the new target and health components, and as always, a name component. I'm adding two here, but you can add as many as you want with a loop, or you can try your hand at setting up a spawner like we did last time for bullets. Next, to give the target some life, let's create a move target system. Here, we need to query for the target and its transform. Notice we are only getting mutable access for the transform, and Bevy will intelligently use this to run systems that are only reading the target in parallel, but the system cannot run at the same time as other transform mutating systems. Let's also get time so we can move our targets at a frame rate independent speed. Now we just simply loop over the targets and adjust their transforms. In the future, we'll probably want targets following a more sophisticated path, but for now, this is good enough. Next, let's get our bullet shooting at the target. I'm going to create a bullet component, and like always, I'll register it with the app so I can see and edit its values in the inspector. For bullets, I want a speed value and a direction value. I'm going to make bullets shoot at the closest target, but once they spawn, they won't change their direction, so they can miss a target if it moves out of the way. Now, our tower shooting system needs to get a little more complex. We still want the basic timer running, but now we want to add the bullet component to the newly spawned entities. I'm also going to get the tower entity in the query and make the bullet a child of the tower using the with children command. This takes a closure, which gives us a child builder. A child builder is basically a weaker form of commands that can only spawn entities, so most of the time I'll just call it commands and ignore the differences. This helps keep our hierarchy clean and organized in the inspector, and it's just a personal preference of mine. Now is a good time to talk about why there are two different transform components on all of our entities. Transforms in Bevy come in a pair of Transform and Global Transform. Basically, Transform is the entity's offset from its parent, and Global Transform is its location in world space. Transform is often set by you, and the engine will handle keeping Global Transform updated through the entity hierarchy. Basically, it boils down to you should always write to the Transform component and read from the Global Transform if you're using entity hierarchies. Now, to spawn our bullet, we need to find the direction of the closest target. So let's add a new query to the system, where we just need the read access to the global transform of all of our targets. We could query for a tuple of the global transform in the target and get read access for both components, but we aren't actually going to read the target's value. We just want the transform of any entity with the target component. So it ends up being both cleaner and more performant to explicitly tell Bevy this using a with constraint. Queries actually support two generic parameters, and that's why you may have seen some weird errors if you ever forgot the tuple parens on any query so far. The first parameter is the one we've been using, which will get you read and write access to components. The second parameter I think of as a filter, and the main things that we can put here are with and without filters. So here we want all of the global transforms from entities with the target component. We can also tuple this filter to get all the transforms from entities with the target component and without the health component, if we wanted, but for now we just want with target. Also, while we're here, let's add the bullet spawn offset as a member of the tower component, instead of hard coding it. Now we can calculate the bullet spawn point by adding the offset to the tower's transform. Now let's calculate the closest target by using the target transform query as a rest iterator. Here we can use min by key, which takes a closure and returns the element in the iterator that has the lowest value when passed to that closure. Here we want the function to be the distance between the bullet transform and the target, so this will return the closest target transform. Notice that floats and rust aren't orderable by default, because they can have exotic values like nan and inf, which don't have a canonical ordering. 
Bevy thankfully gives us a utility called FloatOrd, which makes floats orderable and works great for us, because we're really not expecting any imps or nans to be coming out of Vec3 distance. Finally, let's use map to reach through the option and turn the global transform into a direction by subtracting the translation from the bullet spawn point. If all of this functional stuff was too magical for you, then you can always just turn this into a nested for a loop and do it the more traditional way. Here I just want to show that Bevy queries work with the more powerful features of Rust iterators. Now, if that direction actually exists, which we need to worry about in the case that there may be no targets left. Thankfully, Rust forces us to consider this by giving us direction as an option. Then we want to spawn the bullet like we did in the last episode, but set the direction of the bullet to the one that we calculated. Now we can easily add a bullet move system that just queries for bullets and the mutable access to its transforms, as well as getting the time resource. Then, for every bullet, we just move them in their direction, multiplied by their speed and delta time. Now when we run the game, we see bullets flying toward the target and we can move targets around in the inspector to ensure that bullets are always moving exactly toward the closest target. If you aren't seeing any of this behavior, then double check that you've added all of the new systems to the app builder in main. Next up is making bullets collide with the targets and killing the target after they get hit too many times. Let's create a new system that will check everything with health and despawn them if health is less than or equal to zero. Remember that entity is the only query parameter that we don't need an ampersand before, and we want to use despawn recursive to future-proof our code if we load in a complex model for targets. Now, for a bullet collision system, we just want to query for all the bullets and all the targets. We're getting commands in the bullet entity as well so we can despawn the bullet, and we're getting the target's health so we can damage the targets. In this system, we're just going to do a simple nested loop covering both queries, and then if the bullet transform is within some distance to the target's transform, then we'll despawn the bullet and damage the target. We also break here because we don't want a bullet damaging multiple targets in one frame. We obviously could use a much more sophisticated collision detection system here, and this has many flaws, but I think it will work well for a beginner tutorial. If you want to experiment with a real Bevy's physics engine, I recommend starting with Heron, which is my go-to physics engine for simple games and game jams. Now we actually have all the core gameplay systems we're going to make this episode. The tower can aim at and shoot targets, and after the targets get hit enough, they die and despawn. We haven't really covered anything dramatically new in this episode, but I hope you can see the basic loop of creating components and using queries in different ways to create basic gameplay systems. Now, our main file is getting a little bit long at over 200 lines, so let's see how we can break this up into multiple modules. Glancing at our main app builder, I see three distinct categories of systems and components. Towers, targets, and bullets. So let's break those out into separate files. We also have some weird one-off things like spawning the map and camera, but for now I think we can leave those in main. When we create the three new files, we need to add the mod keyword statement to main for each one to make sure Rust is aware of these new modules. I'm also going to add a pub use for each one here so we can access anything public in those modules and the others through create star. Now I'm going to start moving systems and components to their corresponding files. This is obviously subjective, but organization has to start somewhere. Also, I'm going to add using Bevy Prelude to each one of these files. In real projects, I usually make a lib.rs or a prelude of my own, but I don't think we're at that level of complexity here yet. Now we have an issue of visibility. For me personally, I like components to be completely public unless I have a good reason to hide some of their internal fields. You can implement safe functions accessing and mutating component values if you need, but in practice I usually find it's easier and simpler to understand by just pubbing the fields. Systems, however, I consider to be the private internals of the game, so I won't pub them. So now we have the problem of main not having access to the systems to add them to the builder. The workaround for this, and more importantly, the way to clean up main and bundle our functionality is plugins. We've already seen plugins in part 1 when we added the default plugins. If we look inside this, we see it's a plugin group, which is just a bundle of plugins. If we pick any plugin inside this group, like the transform plugin, then we can see it's using the same app builder pattern we're using in main. It registers its types, and it adds systems, albeit in a more complex way we haven't covered, but the idea is the same. We can do this exact same thing for ourselves by creating a strut in our new files and implementing plugin for it. 
For example, here's how I'd implement this for Tower. We are given a mutable app and we can register all of our components and add our systems to it. Remember, we're really only registering types for the sake of the inspector. Now, in main, we can replace all of those systems and types with a call to add plugin in our new plugin. Notice we use add plugin with no s because we aren't using a plugin group. If you add the s, you'll get a compiler error. And I'm not really a fan of such a subtle difference in function names, but that's a petty complaint. And all of a sudden, we have the same gameplay as before, but with a more organized and scalable project. That's pretty much all I think we have time for in this part. We didn't get to input like I hoped, but we've created the basic loop of a tower defense game's mechanics. Now we're free to add different kinds of towers, bullets, and targets. Also, obviously, we can add a wave system, target spawning, and all kinds of cool things. Next time, we'll do some player input to let the player actually have some impact on the game and spawn their own towers. Sorry for the long delay on this part. I took a few weeks off to get married and celebrate that, but now I'm back and ready to get into the groove of working on tutorials and general videos for this channel. Thank you for your patience. Also, as always, a massive thank you to my Patreons whose support I cannot express how much it means to me. If you have any questions, there's a link to join my Discord server in the description, and as always, remember to like and subscribe, and thank you for watching.